little notice and even less input from voters, Judge Lena Hidalgo fundamentally alters the way Harris County will be governed. Was it a power play or good policy? In the nation's fourth largest city, a housing crisis deepens as home ownership moves beyond the reach of a growing number of Houstonians. And on the troubled Texas border, the return of Donald Trump. Will the symbolic visit trigger action or just deepen the crisis? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Bob Price, Associate Editor of Breitbart, Texas. Next up, former City Council member Sue Lovell. In the three spot, well-known Houston businessman and columnist Bill King. Batting cleanup, longtime super neighborhood leader Tomorrow Bell. And closing us out, conservative strategist Jessica Colon. Let's begin. <laughs> A two-class society deepening here in Harris County. One class earning enough income to purchase a house and the other larger and growing segment locked out of home ownership and locked in to renting on a pretty much permanent basis. Troubling research released by the Kinder Institute revealed that 51% of Harris County families devote nearly a third of their income to housing, with one in four spending half of what they bring in for monthly rent. Home ownership is really becoming out of reach for renters. There's quite a squeeze in the market. We're actually the second least affordable city um, or region behind Las Vegas for very low income people. The real estate sector cannot solve the affordable housing crisis. They don't want to solve the affordable housing crisis. Panel with housing increasingly scarce, rents are rising, and Kinder reports that in 2019, before the pandemic, one out of 11 rental households here received an eviction notice. I'm going straight to tomorrow, Bell. Is it really bad out there for families on the margin? Absolutely, and one of the reasons is because of the cost of construction products. Wood is at an unfathomable about right now. No one expected that the cost of wood would rise the way it has. In addition to that, a lot of people who held off doing work and when the pandemic started, a lot of people started doing projects that they had do. So you got limited other materials, tiles, uh, appliances because of the uh, pandemic. It takes forever to get them here. So everything is costing more right now. I don't believe this is going to last. I believe it will level off. It's just that you got a backlog. Think about it for over 14 months, you know, people never did get back to normal. And then for months, we shut down the world, not the city. We shut down the world. So I do believe that once everything gets all the way back, I do believe the cost will go down and people will be able to buy houses. Sue Lovell, you've been working on affordable housing as a chronic problem for, uh, gosh, decades. Oh, are there solutions here? There are solutions, but you have to have a plan and a strategy. And I have to say, I don't know that will happen with this mayor that's in place. Right now, there are a glut of apartments being built in the city, but about 85 of them right now, you know, they rolled off the tax rolls because they're giving, being given a total exemption of taxes to build, saying it's gonna be affordable, but it's not. It, there could be a partnership between the real estate community, the build developers, and the city on when they build their apartments to let the city buy down the cost of those doors and move people in, just like we did downtown when we were building up downtown. But again, there's no strategy. There's no plan in place at all. And um, I don't think there'll be any solution as long as this administration is in place. Bill King, you're a student of this real estate market and trends. Uh, what do you see happening in Houston? Can this, this, this trend of folks being priced out of home ownership be reversed? Well, you know, there, there's a, a temporary market dislocation uh, right now, but this is a longer term trend that's been going on for a long time. And part of it is just the cost of, of taxes, uh, the water rates just are gonna double here over the next four or five years. Uh, flood insurance premiums are going up because we haven't taken care of our flooding problems. 
all of these failures of our local government to address these basic infrastructure needs are starting to back up. Um, look, I think that uh, at some point in time, the market's going to adjust because, you know, we just got the population estimate. Basically, I think the city of Houston gained 400 people last year total. And so at some point in time, it's going to equalize. Uh, but we're in this temporary uh, situation. It also has a lot to do with the way the economy is changing. And increasingly, we've got people that are paid very high for these high skilled jobs and a lot of low paid service workers and not many people in between. Uh, and by the way, wait until interest rates going back up. All right, Bob Price, you've owned property here in Houston. You've run a business here in Houston. Uh, what's your take on this, this problem? Well, inflation is certainly rearing its evil head all over the place. Uh, one of the products that my company makes, I just got a price quote from our supplier and it went up 300% from when I purchased it two years ago. Um, and it's it, it's not just lumber, it, it's uh, the foam that goes into to refrigeration units, it's microchips, it, it's basically everything. And the reason is we, we shut down the world's economy for an entire year because of COVID, but nobody's demand shut off. The demand kept not only staying active, it actually increased. And so companies just ran out of everything. And I talk to manufacturers every day now that still say they can't get people to come to work because Joe Biden's paying them to stay home. So all of those things factor in together to drive up the cost. I think there was a, a shortage of housing created after Harvey, obviously, and that factor is still weighing its way through the, the Houston economy. But there's also an exodus going on. People like myself that moved out of the city and said, you know, we're gonna live somewhere else now. And you're seeing real estate properties all over the rural communities, two counties out from Houston that are just growing like gangbusters. All right, Jessica, some folks say government is the answer here. Government needs to buy uh, more properties and subsidize them. Your thoughts? Well, I know Tony's not here today. He probably would agree with you, but I, not to speak for him, but I, uh, you know, home ownership is one of the key definitions of the American dream. And we, people are moving to Texas to live the American dream. Um, you're talking about an exodus out of Harris County. We're absolutely having an invasion from other states. And the reason that we're having this um, urban sprawl, like Bob is saying, outside of these rural counties, you still can't go, you could go two counties away and see that a 3-2 home is four hundred thousand dollars so this isn't just in harris county it's this entire region that's growing by leaps and bounds right now i-10 has been under construction for 30 miles expanding all the way to almost columbus because they're anticipating the growth so yes 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 hold that thought we're going to talk about it more okay when we come back we're going to talk about more and the reality and implications of the rising cost and scarcity of housing and later controversy at Commissioner's Court where Judge Lena Hidalgo and her allies have fundamentally altered the way Harris County will be governed. We ask, why was there so little input from those he, she's supposed to represent? Welcome back as we continue our dive into the ever-increasing cost of keeping a decent roof over your head in Houston, Texas. Now, as we just discussed, the cost of all levels of housing have rapidly increased. So does that mean the dream of home ownership will move beyond the reach of the working class? Or is the current scarcity a temporary condition? Panel, some on the left see housing as a basic human right and want a great deal more government intervention. Let's continue our conversation with Jessica Colon. Sure, you know, this it, This comes with the cost of having a big city that is exploding with growth like Houston is. And as I was saying, it's not just about Houston, it's our entire region that is growing by leaps and bounds. And so, you know, there's only so much land available now. And you're seeing a lot of that land that maybe had 40 homes on it, and maybe you had some renters and you had some folks that have lived there for 50 years. Now those plots have come together and a high rise is going up. And that's bringing the cost of home ownership up in Houston. We're seeing these high rises come up all over the place, um, inside the loop, inside the beltway. Uh, so as we expand, you know, it comes down to, are you are you going to live in the city? Um, our, our concerns here are, are not unique. 
unique to Houston. This is what every big city faces. The questions everyone that wants to live in the city faces. If you want to live downtown, if you want to live close to the city, the cost of a home tends to increase. So we don't want to price ourselves out of the market in Houston or in Texas. What ultimately is going to be the deciding factor on that for a lot of families is property taxes. And we have to do something about lowering our property taxes here. Sue Lovell, are there good public-private partnerships that can alleviate some of the problems we're seeing? Well, um, yes and no. The, the private partnerships that I see right now, there's about 85 of them that are in place, actually takes all that property uh, and that off the, uh, the tax rolls. That's a lot of money to be lost, a property tax to the city, and I think is gonna put us in a, in a crisis in the future. You know, right now it is absolutely a seller's market in the housing. It, someday it'll be a buyer's. The most important thing is in apartments. Right now, the cost of apartments are very high. And for the people that don't want to spend half of their income um, on rent, uh, the availability of lower cost apartments are, are disappearing and they're not there. And there's no replenishment of that. So it brings a real crisis. All right, Bill King. In the city of Houston, 60% of the residents rent and that's rising. Is that uh, a, a trouble marker for you? Well, you know, we're a young city and there's a lot of young people that don't want to own a home and that, that'll change as they get older. This is part of the natural process. But you know, look, we're making it very difficult in the city uh, to develop affordable housing. And I'm not a big fan of the government getting involved in this because every time they do, they screw it up. And we had a billion dollars of money to give away to help people whose homes were, were damaged in Harvey, and we couldn't even figure out how to give money away. That's, you know, not promising for something more complicated. I, I think you got to create a value proposition. We keep raising property taxes, just double the water uh, rates. We have a drainage fee that we then didn't spend on drainage. Uh, they're talking about putting in a garbage fee. I mean, all of these things. School district is an issue. You've got to create a value proposition. We're not doing that in Houston right now. And by the way, Houston is not growing. The region is, the city's not. All right, tomorrow, last 20 seconds to you. Uh, half of the folks in Houston spend a third of their income on housing. Is that a problem? Uh, yes, it is a problem because of the desertification that the city allowed with Chapter 42 being implemented and where you used to have one single house, you have six units and the units that are building that where that single house is, the, ho the homeowners or the people that used to live there cannot afford it and cannot move back. Got to leave it there. Up next, former President Trump's return to the troubled Texas border. Will the visit shine additional light on the continuing crisis? Amid record illegal crossings and an onslaught of narcotic smuggling, former President Donald Trump traveled to the Rio Grande Valley at the invitation of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Mr. Trump said that under his administration, 500 miles of wall were built and the border was the safest it's been in decades. He also claimed human trafficking and drug smuggling had dried up because of increased security. The former president accused Democrats of conducting a campaign of disinformation. They're saying that the unsafe border is your fault. You believe this? <laughs> because they're getting killed with the border. So now they're saying, oh, we got a problem. So let's blame the sheriffs. Let's blame the governors. Let's blame everybody else but them. Panel, I know and frankly, you know, lots of Texas Republicans who headed south Wednesday for the photo op. Question is, will Trump's visit spark any action from President Joe Biden? Got to go to Bob Price on this. Well, President Trump, when he was down at the border today on Wednesday, said that, that the Biden administration is either incompetent or they're doing this on purpose. And I don't think anybody could be this incompetent. So draw your own conclusion on why this is happening down at the border. The fact is the Biden administration with a single pin stroke wiped out all of the successful programs put in place by Donald Trump. Programs like the Remain in Mexico program, programs like uh, the agreements with Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras to return these migrants back to their home country. The policies that would 
let people know with absolute certainty that if you cross the border into the United States, you would be returned back to your home country. Those policies were wiped out, and the result of that was a 20-year high, record highs, of not just migrants coming across, but these unaccompanied children, these family members, all of these people, and the Biden administration does nothing about it. Uh, Kamala Harris came here last week to a section of the border that is the most secured section of the entire U.S. border. The border walls have been in place in El Paso for years, and they work. She needs to come. The Biden needs to come. This is the president's responsibility. He needs to quit handing it off to incompetent Kamala and come down here and and look at the problem. Look at the listen to the stories of these children that are on suicide watch in the, in Biden cages because of the depression that they're facing under these horrid conditions that they're putting these people under. Listen to the stories of the women that are being raped. Uh, Sheriff Benny Martinez today he talked about the number of rapes that happen in, in his county, 80 miles from the border. All right, Bill King, from a pragmatic political point of view, uh, were you surprised to see all of the Republicans in Texas that went down to greet the former president? Well, look, uh, Trump is still very popular with Republican primary voters. I think that, you know, those photos make him like to haunt him in the general election this year. But I tell you, Democrats are badly misjudging this issue. Uh, there's a UT Tyler poll out on this, and uh, Latinos are un unhappy with this. African Americans are unhappy with this. I mean, there's not any group that's in favor or thinks that the Biden administration is doing a good job on this. This could really be the Biden and the Democrats administration's Achilles heel, I think, if they don't get a handle on it. Tomorrow, you always call it like you see it. Is the Biden administration m messing up on the border? Absolutely. I said it before and I'll say it again. When Trump got in, anything he said Obama, he took it out, wiped it out, tried it with Obamacare. Biden them came in and did the same thing. What they were doing on the border seemed to be working. This is not working now. I'm telling you, you've got to get a hand on this. And I don't understand how um, they keep talking about it. it's about compassion and it's about this. That's not what I'm seeing. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong channel, but I'm not seeing what they're saying that they're doing what they're doing because it's so compassionate. I don't know what the hell about what they think compassion mean, but this bill is right because I'm one of those people who are not pleased. All right, Jessica, the former president came here at the invitation of Greg Abbott. Uh, why does Abbott need Trump's help here in Texas? The obvious question. Well, this is the border security is one of Trump's greatest success stories from his administration. <laughs> and everything Bob said is accurate. We had crime go down, we had a secure border, human trafficking, we were attempting to curb it better than ever before. Catch and release uh, was successfully declined. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, this wall needs to be finished. And Abbott has staked a claim that he's gonna get it done. So this is just underscoring a policy that, that the governor has brought forward. And there's there's no better champion of the border wall to bring in than President Trump. And you know, this is something that, uh, like we were saying, this is sheer stubbornness and on the part of the Biden administration. And if you're not heeding the warning of McAllen electing a conservative mayor who, who is a Republican and watching these border counties and border districts start to ebb to toward a Republican column, you're completely being negligent for your cycle. Gonna, so better for the Republicans. Better leave it there. Coming up, an American athlete protests the nation she's supposed to represent. Should her disdain for America be a disqualifying action? Question, should an athlete be required to love or at least respect one's country to represent it on the international stage? Gwen Berry, an elite competitor in the hammer throw, was disparagingly inattentive during the playing of the national anthem following her third place finish at the Olympic trials. Berry then pulled a t-shirt over her head which read, activist athlete, prompting Houston Congressman Dan Crenshaw to speak out on national television. We don't need any more activist athletes. I, I, you know, she should be removed from the team. The entire point of the Olympic team is to represent the United States of America. That's the entire point. 
Okay, so, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing when these NBA players do it. Okay, fine, we'll just stop watching. But now the Olympic team, and it's, it's multiple cases of this, they, they, they should be removed. That, that should be the bare minimum requirement is that you, is that you believe in the country representing. All right, Sue Lovell, what do you make of this controversy? Well, first, I, I'm kind of resentful of the IOC trying to tell our country what our athletes can and cannot do. And, you know, uh, we are a kind of democracy and we have freedom of speech. And I don't think that it's, um, I, I, I think you ought to be able to express yourself the way that you want to. Uh, and they're professional athletes now. This is not amateur hour. Um, they're, they're all professional, just like the N NBA stars are. So I don't know why the congressman is making an exception saying, well, not NBA. I mean, and you can be an athlete and you can have a point of view and you can be an activist. It doesn't say you just have to go and compete and then be nothing else. And, you know, we are we, we have fought for freedom of speech. And I believe she was showing her, you know, her thoughts and it was freedom of speech. Bob Price, did uh, Congressman Ken Crenshaw get this one right? Well, I think the congressman is certainly willing, uh, free to express himself any way he wants to, just like this athlete is free to express herself as she chooses to. But to the, the rules that are put in place by the IOC have been there since 1975. Uh, they, they need to be equally enforced across the world. We don't need, in, this is a place for sports. This is a place for athletes at the peak of their fitness and premier level athleticism to come out there and show the world what they can do as athletes people don't want to hear about the whatever their political viewpoints whether it's american viewpoints or french viewpoints or chinese viewpoints or whatever come out there perform win your game and bring the medals home all right tomorrow bell how do you come down on this one listen uh one of the things when you get to compete at this level and when you are going out and they accept you on a team Teams have rules. IOC has rules. Lakers have rules. The Bucks have rules. The Rockets have rules. Teams have rules. When you play, you play by the rules. IOC says you cannot do anything to show your political nothing. They say you can't kneel. You can't put your fists up in the air. They list what you cannot do. You cannot wear anything that in any way advertises your political preference. That is a team rule. Come on, baby, you made the team. Play by the rules. All right, we're leaving it there. Up next, with little input from the public, Lena Hidalgo has changed the way Harris County will be governed. Was she justified or just consolidating power? With little notice to or input from taxpayers, Judge Lena Hidalgo this week rammed through a seismic shift in the fundamental manner Harris County will be governed moving forward. With the full support of two Democratic commissioners, Hidalgo will appoint a county administrator and grant that person far-reaching power to purportedly streamline and coordinate all county operations, including hiring and firing. Critics, including the two Republicans on the court, called the move a naked power grab, which shifts vital decision-making to a bureaucrat beholden to the party in power. I do not believe that, that anyone, no matter how well-meaning that they may be, should be given this Supreme Chancellor-style powers over all the other 20 uh, departments in this county. Public transparency, we get an F on in terms of this if issue. We got to modernize, man. This, I mean, to, this is so it's very wonky. I can't run a re-election on this topic. I'm doing it because it matters for good government. Hidalgo points out most major counties in Texas have hired an administrator, as have many major jurisdictions across the country. Panel, my biggest problem here was a county chief executive who constantly preaches transparency, but on this critical issue, pretty shamelessly kicked it completely to the curb, in effect saying, I know best and I don't need to educate or persuade taxpayers. Tomorrow, Bell, you spoke at this meeting. What's your take? 
listen, one of the first things they kept saying was accountability, that this was being done for accountability and transparency. None of that happened in putting this in place. Absolutely none of this. This came out late Thursday that it was going to be on there to be discussed in executive session. It wasn't even going to be uh, discussed in public session, in executive session to give an individual who is unaccountable to the public this kind of power. Now, let me explain to you my problem with this. When you run for office and when people select you for the duties that they give and trust you to do, you are accountable to the people. When you are an employee, you are not accountable to the public. You are accountable to whoever put you in that office. Do I think this is a problem? Hell yeah. This is the second time they have done this. And I'm telling you, you want to talk about voter suppression? This is voter suppression because everybody picked who they wanted to do that in their precinct. And now you're turning around and giving it to somebody else, just like you did for the county clerk and the county tax assessor. Don't forget this, Houston and Harris County. Don't forget this. Sue Lovell, what do you make of this? You're an astute political observer. Take 30 seconds. Um, I don't think that the, the, the judge spent $5 million on a study to tell her how she thinks for a department that's gonna cost two million. This is absolutely not transparent. It's absolutely a wrong move. I agree, we voted and elected the people that we want to be our decision makers, not people to be appointed. And also, you ought to have meetings that don't run until one o'clock in the morning if you wanna be accountable. We're talking about that next. Bill King, what's your take? You know, first of all, I'd like to point out that the Republicans had control of the court for, I don't know, 40 years and never, ever pulled this kind of power play. Uh, when Sylvia Garcia was the Democratic commissioner in Precinct 2 and El Franco Lee in Precinct 1, they were left alone and let to run things in their precinct like they want. So, you know, this is something that's completely unprecedented in Harris County history. Frankly, whether it's a good idea or not, who knows? I mean, because we don't have any, any information to make that decision. Uh, they go off and, and hire these consultants. They tell them what they want them to write, and then they write that. But here's the here's the the great irony of this. This is going to be tremendously backfire, because from now on, when Ramsey and Cagle have any of their constituents come in and complain about something, they're going to say, "Gee, you know what? I'd like to fix that." But Lena Hidalgo is now running the county. Here's her telephone number. All right, Jess, we got 30 seconds. Do you think voters are watching this? I hope they are. I hope they are. I hope this gets the attention of voters uh, in that Lena Hidalgo said she can't run an election on this. She's right. Because if I was running for county judge, I would be running on of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that's who elected <laughs> these commissioners. And that's what she's doing is creating bureaucracy where they can change rules and bylaws and code without any representation from voters out there. And this is this is what they are doing in Washington under the Biden administration, taking the bureaucracies and doing the same thing. And they're looking to move and do the same thing here in Harris County. If between the crime and the power grabs of what Hidalgo is doing, voters must be paying attention to how they are losing their voice as taxpayers. All right, we're leaving it there. Still to come, more controversy at Harris County where constables have had to fork over their department's savings accounts Critics are calling that defunding police. And later, new polling on Texas Governor Greg Abbott has his aggressive border stance and power grid problems impacted his popularity. Harris County constables are quietly furious. After saving dollars in so-called rollover accounts, a Democratic majority on commissioner's court effectively clawed back a portion of those surpluses into the general fund which led some constables to report they would have to cut services and potentially lay off officers. Judge Lena Hidalgo claims the rollover funds will be spent elsewhere to improve public safety. And with crime going up, we cannot afford, and I disagree, Commissioner Cable, we cannot afford to have these savings accounts. We can't. I mean, we've got to spend the money on tackling the, the, the rise in violent crime. The reality to me is, is that I had $52 million Last year at this time and this time this year, I have $44 million. Um, and the numbers are that if you take my full labor cost, my non-labor cost, I have a deficit of $2.48 million, which correlates into about uh, 22 positions. 
While Judge Hidalgo calls it budget discipline, critics are calling it defunding police. Panel, what's your take on what's going down? Is this just shifting surplus funds into the immediate fight against crime? I mean, Bob, does it sound to you more like defunding police? I think it's definitely defunding police. It, it's an issue of, of taking money away from police officers or police departments and moving it to the county commission, or the county judge where she can do what she wants with it. This is just one power grab after another. Ever since she's taken office between the shutdowns, the, the, the uh, releasing and forcing release of, of criminals back onto the streets, you know, she thinks she knows how to stop violent crime better than these law enforcement professionals that are at the street level, and yet she's the one that's forcing the release of these people back out onto the streets. Then you see her stealing the power away from the county clerk, the tax assessor's office, now from the commissioners. It's just one power grab after another, and that's what she's after at this. All right, Tamara Bell, you've been watching this one closely. Listen, this is beyond a, a re Okay, you're gonna take uh, what I've been told is almost 20 million from the people who were elected to do public safety. And the reason that they were elected to do public safety is because we need public safety officers doing public safety. Now you take that money and you say you got this whole new program. Hey, look, you may have this whole new program, but crime is going up. And the reason that most of the crime is going up, it's not so much because of the law officers, it's because the damn court's been closed. Because if you got crime and you got no punishment, crime is just gonna keep going up, 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 up. Why don't you open up the courts all 24 hours? Hell, Night Court was a TV show. They got Night Court, get this done, then maybe crime will go down. All right, Bill King, what's your take? Problem is you got a bunch of people at the county trying to run this massive organization who have zero management experience. Lena Dalgo had none, Rodney had none. Adrian's only experience was the sheriff's office, which was <laughs> um, controversial, let's put it that way, at, at best. And they're relying on these management consultants that they're bringing in from out of state that don't know anything about this community, don't know anything about Texas government. And this it's like a third world country. I mean, it's all about how do I get power into my hand? You know, I expect any day that they're going to just, you know, disband the police and say, we're going to have private security that we're going to control or something. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. All right, Sue, 20 seconds, go. You want to keep the neighborhood safe. And, and I'll tell you, neighborhoods rely on their constables. It is defunding the constables because they're the ones that show up. When you're robbed, they show up. When your car is broken into, they show up. They're the ones that really patrol the neighborhoods like people want. I hope people are outraged about this. And I hope that they go to the ballot box and they let people know how outraged they are about our constables being defunded. Well done, Sue. Still to come, the looming battle over dozens of electronic billboards. Will the Bayou City reject or welcome a jumbotron invasion? Down at City Hall, the drums of war are beginning to beat over a proposal to build 50 giant jumbotrons across Houston on public land. Mayor Sylvester Turner, in search of a multi-million dollar revenue stream, has requested bids from major billboard providers. That's raised alarm at Scenic Houston, the venerable, well-funded advocacy group, which has waged a largely successful four-decade campaign to dramatically reduce so-called sign blight in the Bayou City. Our sign code is one of the most admired in the country. So let's not go changing that it's a very slippery slope once you let this company come in and put up 50 led boards you have to let the other billboard companies do the same and i don't think any of us want our city lit up like a las vegas or a times square 50 two-sided billboards actually amounts to 100 screens critics say they never turn off running 24 7 and represent a distraction to drivers Panel, last word we got was that there was nothing before the mayor, but clearly Scenic Houston is mobilizing for a fight. What's going on, Sue Lovell? They are, and they should, because they got lied to about the kiosk. Look, this is old technology. It really is billboards are. Everybody walks around with a billboard in their hand. Now, if you need to get a message or advertise, it's called your phone. So this technology, I think, needs to go away. And it is, it's blight. It's, it's, it's graffiti, it's graffiti on a stick. And, and, and I, I would absolutely oppose 
um, this happening, and I hope Sandy Houston gets revved up and remembers they got lied to about the kiosk. They're going to be lied to about these billboards that are going up. It's not good technology. It's old technology. Tomorrow, Bell, will they have an ally with the super neighborhoods? I doubt that. Uh, Guy Eagles brought this up to us um, over three years ago. He he discussed this with us, and then uh, Harvey happened, and it was table because one of the things that we were locking up with them about is the fact that how many were you going to take down for each one you put up? And uh, we were at, you know talking about 10, 20. They talking about maybe three. That, that makes no sense. In addition to that, using public space, and because they put all these high rises in there, who the hell want that stuff flashing at night in their face 24 seven? So that is not something that I believe that we will be supporting. I know personally, I shocked. Okay, Bill King, what do you think of this? Well, I don't like to think of myself as I told you so kind of a guy, but uh, I did you know, uh, had all these sort of inside the loop white liberals, many friends of mine who said, you know, we've got to go support Sylvester because he's right on climate change and he's right on bike policy. He's right on the hero ordinance. All these things that didn't make any difference. He hadn't done anything on any of those, by the way. Uh, and they, if they looked at his history, they know this is a transactional politician. He's going to go wherever the money is. That's why he took money from strip clubs and let them get away with whatever they want to. And so, uh, look, guys, I'm sorry. You got what you voted for. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Still ahead, new polling on the popularity of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. With a re-election bid looming, has his push for permitless carry and tough stance on the border enhanced his standing with voters? Some new and very interesting polling from UT and the Texas Tribune. Following the debacle of the deadly winter storm, a legislative session chocked full of hard right Republican initiatives and a controversial commitment to continue building the border wall, Governor Greg Abbott's approval rating among Texans stood at 44 percent, with an equivalent 44 percent of those participating in the survey expressing disapproval. Panel considering the coming special session and Abbott's high profile hosting of Trump on the Rio Grande, What's your point? Gosh, we've got Jessica Cologne here. What do you make of these numbers? Well, it's not surprising that when you're polling the electorate, a general election electorate, that half the people like the incumbent and half the people don't. And then you have people in the middle uh, that that are undecided. So it's 44 on one side, 44 on another, and then you have the undecided vote. So that's not uncommon at all. The more important number for Governor Abbott right now is that he has an approval rating of over 75% with Republican primary voters, and it will rise after this uh, trip with President Trump and his efforts for to secure our border. And he's going to have a great special session. He's going to have two of them, so two bites at the apple there to keep promoting good legislation um, for conservatives here in Texas headed into the election year. So no surprise, he's one of the most popular uh, Republican governors in the in the country, and he has a higher approval rating right now than Joe Biden in Texas, Senator Cruz, and on uh, many other statewide. So he's, he's doing great, and he's gonna win in November next year. All right, Bob Price, you hear anything you disagree with there? No, I, I don't at all. I, I... I think looking at a poll for a general election when the opposing party hasn't even been named yet is, is kind of difficult to put any faith in that for any, any value to it. Um, you know, one of the Texas nat statewide publications called Greg Abbott the most powerful governor in Texas history. And he certainly has had to govern in a very tough period of time this last term. He's had to make very crucial decisions that are going to piss off a lot of people. And, and he's made those dis tough decisions and done what he thought was the right thing to do while sticking with Republican values of trying to keep things at the, at the local government level and still maintaining the issues of border security and, and Second Amendment rights. All right, Tamar, you see any Democrats out there who could challenge Abbott effectively if he wins his party's nomination? Uh, no, I'll, I have not really looked at that. What I was really wanting to know from Abbott was how much was his cut from ERCOT? <laughs> All right, Bill King finishes off here. Last 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised it was as high as 44 coming out of the, the February storm, but people have pretty short memories. 
the other, and I think a lot depends on whether we have another power problem between now and the election. If we have another one after he did his mission accomplished speech down there, I think it's going to really hurt him. The other thing, frankly, that I've been sort of interested in is the polling on the licenseless, you know, gun carry is just incredibly negative, especially among women. I think that may hurt him in the general election. Got to leave it there. Up next, as we celebrate America's birthday, our panel explores what it truly means to be a patriot.